Hey, and welcome to my new podcast, Phoenix Unleashed. people it's Kylie here and on this episode today I'm going to share with you the story that made me a number one best-selling author so if you follow me on my social media you will notice that I talk about how I'm an award-winning hypnotherapist and past life regressionist and then I also share the fact that I became a number one best-selling author so I had an opportunity come up about two years ago where the business that I was working in was had an opportunity they wanted to bring out a collaborative book so they put it out there that they wanted between 20 to 25 authors to come together and share their stories that made them you know their stories of how they became an entrepreneur how they became a mompreneur in this case and what they ever came to do that so I sent my story in there was a price that I had to pay to put forward. So I paid that price. I sent my story in. They chose my story and I was in a collaborative book. Now, straight away, this book was published through Amazon. So it, they uploaded it and put it through there. The company I was working for at the time was based in the UK. So they put it on the UK, Amazon, and also the US. And the book straight away went to number one both in the Kindle and the paperback version. So it went number one on Amazon in the UK, in the US. So it made me a number one best-selling author and I was sent like a little badge for that to happen. So the book that I'm talking about is called Mumpreneur on Fire Australian Edition. And it was through the company I was working at the time called Mums in Business Association. Now this company has since finished up. The owners no um no longer saw eye to eye, had different visions and the company has now closed and both the owners have gone up on their own ways and onto other businesses and new exciting adventures. So I believe you can still purchase this book on Amazon. However, today I'm going to read to you the story that I submitted just so you can have a bit more background of me and what I'm doing. And then also this may inspire you to get involved in your own collaborative book project or just start writing your own book. So, as I said, I published this back, it would have been two years ago before all of the COVID stuff happened. And in the end, even though there were supposed to be 20 to 25 authors, we ended up with 12 amazing authors. So, everyone in Australia that was a mumpreneur and had started on that journey shared their story. So, as I said, you can probably still get it online on Amazon. If not, you can read it on my blog if you head to thephoenixwithin.com.au, which is my publishing company that I've started. You can read about it there, and I'm going to read it to you today. So, here we go. So, I dedicate this chapter to my little family of awesomeness. Thank you to Kim for all your support and encouragement. Thank you to my girls, Scarlett and Bronte, for inspiring, motivating, and empowering me every day to be the best I can be. I am so blessed. And now I have to add them to that little Imogen because she was not even a thought at this time that I released this book. I remembered who I was and the game changed. As I sit here in the early hours of the morning, my two girls, aged three and one, are lying with me. I can't sleep, but they have passed out while we snuggled on our recliner, cuddling and watching a movie. The same movie I've watched already twice today with them. I look at their beautiful faces, my three-year-old's long curly hair and my one-year-old's porcelain doll-like complexion. And it reminds me of how precious they are and how I would do anything to defend them, ensure that they were never in danger. My maternal instinct is strong and it pained me for a long time to feel like no one had that strong maternal urge to protect me. I love 3am. It's the time when the world is quiet, the time for the dreamers, the crafters and the thinkers. I've always been a night owl and relished the time. The time where I can catch up on everything, no phone going off, no expectations, as generally the whole world is asleep. A perfect time to work on my business, study and review my life and the direction that I am headed in. Although I enjoy the silence of the night, at times it can also bring a lot of old memories that I have spent a lot of time trying to keep dormant. 
The quiet air of the early morning allows for my mind to wander and a memory can lead on to another memory. And next thing I know, I am reliving memories that as a child I had suppressed for a long time. Tonight, I have pulled out my laptop to sit and try to tell my story, but I'm finding it so hard. Until I found this quote from Brene Brown, courage is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. So here I go. Here is a glimpse into the story of me and my journey to becoming an entrepreneur, and I'm sharing it with my whole heart. I am the eldest of seven children and was born in Adelaide in 1987. Soon after my birth, my parents relocated back to New South Wales. Now that I am sitting here reviewing my journey to now, I realise I had blocked out a lot of my childhood. When people asked about my upbringing, I'd always change the subject. And not only did I not want to share, I didn't want to bring up the memories. I had buried these memories and applied concrete slab after concrete slab on top of them. And it wasn't worth the time and my mental state to remove these slabs to share them. I didn't realize in doing this, I was hiding my story. I had buried a piece of myself and I was causing myself more harm mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually by adding more and more concrete slabs to these memories and experiences. This would come to affect how I parent, work, study, and have relationships and friendships. I never felt like I was brought up in the traditional sense. I felt like I survived and went from a kid to an adult so quickly. My first childhood memory was watching my mother being carried out of her house by two men in white uniforms as she yelled, screamed, and fought them. She was placed in the back of an ambulance and taken to hospital. She had consumed too much alcohol that night and her parents had called ambulance officers and policemen to take her away. I remember huddling up with my two younger siblings and making the decision then at the age of seven that she clearly couldn't look after herself. So how could she look after us? The age of seven was a tough year for me and one that I have buried deep, deep inside. It was a year I believe my childhood had ended and had grown up faster than I should have. It was the year my parents had first separated. It was a year of eating dog biscuits due to lack of food available, a year of neglect and abandonment, a year of being left at school way past day's end and made to sit outside the fence in the heat waiting for someone to collect me, a year of sexual abuse by an older child who would babysit me often. Years later, I addressed this issue with the person who had continually put me into this situation, hoping that their response would bring me some closure. I was informed that I was continually put into this situation because I liked it and clearly wanted it. My childhood years were quite nomadic. My parents moved all over New South Wales. Every couple of months or years, I would get at itchy feet, pull out an atlas, close their eyes and point to a location and that's where we would end up. Even though they had separated, they would still move to a new location together. Due to this, our moves were never to another suburb or down the road. They would be at least three hours away, up and down the coast. So this meant I moved schools quite a bit. I consistently went through the new girl phase. And by the time my parents, who were both on Centrelink benefits, could afford to buy me the correct uniform to wear, we were off on our next adventure. This occurred until my on-again, off-again parents split up for good when I was 14. For a few years, my father was a single father to me and my siblings, while my mother was not living under the same roof as us. As the eldest child, I became a second mum to my siblings. One day, my mother reappeared into our lives and had my father falsely arrested for assault and took custody of the children. At the time, I was 14, and my mother and I did not get along. Not happy with dealing with a defiant teenager who wouldn't assist her with disciplining her children in unorthodox ways, I was kicked out of the home with only the clothes on my back and told if I returned, she would have me arrested. 
My younger sister, who didn't agree with what was going on, was also kicked out of the home and joined me. For over 10 years, my father fought for custody of my siblings to no avail. Just before this happened, my father was diagnosed with Ramsey's Hunt syndrome, emphysema and COPD. My disabled father was offered no support and because he couldn't afford a proper legal defence, it was just him and me, his 14-year-old lawyer. My father never regained custody. So my sister and I lived with him and over time, when my other siblings were old enough and forced out of the house by their mother, they would move down to Sydney to live with us. At the age of 18, I found myself homeless again. After being my father's carer for the previous four years, we came to loggerheads and I was asked to leave. For a couple of weeks, I couch surfed until I was able to secure a small flat at the back of a property about 15 minutes out of town. The owner was Maltese with a strong accent. He kept goats on the property to keep the grass down. I would often chat with them and they would always run around in front of my small flat. My flat was at the back of his property and away from the main road. At the time, I was working three casual jobs, studying at university and struggling financially. One day I was leaving the flat to head to work and just outside my front door, the owner had constructed a campfire. I didn't think anything of this when I first saw it, as he had a tree and would regularly have a fire to clean up any fallen branches or debris on the property. Except today, he was sitting at the fire chewing on what happened to be a drumstick. He motioned me towards him, saying, Come, Kylie, join me for some lunch. You'll love it. As I headed over to join him at the fire to politely decline, I had another look towards the fire as an uncommon smell hit my nose. That is when I saw the goat hanging over the fire, roasting. The drumstick in my landlord's hand was a goat leg. You were getting too attached to the goats, so I thought this was the best solution. It was time to move out of that place, and not wanting to go back to couch surfing, I ended up moving in with my on-again, off-again boyfriend. This experience would teach me later down the track to trust my gut and only my gut. I had been with my boyfriend for about a year and he was my first love. Once I moved in with him, I was under the assumption that things would be easier. Of course, we would share the bills and that way I could concentrate on my university and maybe drop one of my three jobs. Unfortunately, this was not the case. And in the end, I had to leave university. I lost all three of my jobs and ended up in a lot of financial debt. Now I look back on it, there were so many alarm bells, but my rose-coloured glasses were on and I was so enamoured by him that someone would love me, be interested in me and care about me and my opinion that I ignored the alarm bells because at the end of the day, everyone who had told me they had loved me had hurt me, so it was just normal, yeah? Clearly, due to my history and my luck, I was meant to be here. At times, my wallet and keys would go missing before I had an outing with friends or a university class or an exam or a work shift. It was so strange as I had clearly placed them in their normal spot and now they had gone. I must have misplaced them. Then, as if by magic, they would always show up later back in their spot when we needed to head out somewhere together. The abusive relationship went on for almost three years. His parents were aware it was happening and turned a blind eye because their son would never do this. She clearly brought it on herself. On one horrific occasion, I was able to escape the room I had been locked up in with ripped pyjamas, a bruised face and a damaged rib cage, which is still never properly healed. I was hospitalised for the bruising and was forced by my father and sister to go to the local police station to file an AVO, an apprehended violence order, against him, which I did. When he noticed I was no longer in the locked room, he went searching for me and found out I was at the police station and showed up to speak to me and try to stop me from going ahead with it. When he wasn't allowed to approach me and was asked to leave the station, 
his pregnant sister arrived and proceeded to speak to the police officer about how I was crazy and was clearly raising the issue to affect her unborn baby. Even after I was granted the AVO, I went back to this mentally, physically, sexually abusive relationship and I was isolated. It all exploded for the final time when we had a party at our house and he went to lash out at me after his dog was defecating on the carpet. I left the house and I never returned. In life, sometimes things change in an instant and at that point, I knew I deserved more. With no relationship, no job, no university, no home and a stack of debt, it was time to find a full-time job. I started in retail management with a large discount departmental company. I continued to work in retail management for the next 10 years. And now I look back, I had a similar relationship to that workplace like I did with my ex-boyfriend. I was working a lot. Some shifts were up to 20 hours with a short nap at home and then I was back. I missed out on birthdays, celebrations and outings to try and get that fictional carrot that was always dangled in front of me to earn that next pay rise, that next promotion or that next bonus. Even through these struggles, I would think, it's okay, it's a good paying job, it gives good experience. They have promised it to me, so if I just keep going, it will happen for sure. I went through the ranks quickly into senior retail management where I was managing over 100 people and generating yearly turnovers of $20 million plus. The carrot was still regularly dangled, and this was even more evident when I was finally given my last promotion at 35 weeks pregnant with my first child. I'd been doing the role for months, and extra roles as requested, like being the project manager of a refit, where we refitted a 30-year-old store, roof, walls, floor, back of house, and front, in just five weeks, while the store was still trading regularly, and yet they wouldn't send out my contract to sign. I finally received my contract when I refused to advise them of my upcoming maternity leave and told them I was happy to deliver my baby on the shop floor if I needed to. The job wasn't all bad. I had met amazing people and learnt leadership skills. I had built stores from scratch, turned unprofitable stores close to shutting their doors into profitable flagships leading the company. I worked in 14 stores in 12 months, and I was moved to locations both metro and regionally. It developed my love for business, retail, customer service, and smashing every challenge thrown at me. That company also introduced me to my amazing partner of 10 years, Kim. I was attracted to his quirkiness his authenticity, and he made me laugh. Plus, who wouldn't want to hang out with a blacksmith turned material scientist? The first time he invited me to his house to hang out and watch a movie, he came into the lounge wearing some chain mail he had made himself and handed me a broadsword and instructed me to check out how quality his craftsmanship was by stabbing him. My personal life was on track but now my professional life was changing. It sadly all turned even more sour with the company when I was asked to return to work after six months of my maternity leave, and I wasn't ready. Instead of returning to the store I had previously been running and was promised I would return to, they placed me at a store that was neglected, unprofitable, and a lot of unresolved issues that at the time I was not ready for. Later, I would find out I also wouldn't have had the support from my bosses to deal with what needed to be done. The next seven months were hell. I was caught between a cowardly narcissist who threatened my family regularly, not directly to me, but to all my staff and customers, and a boss who thought I was after her job. If I didn't jump through her hoops, things would turn sour. Emails at 11.30 p.m. and reprimanded for not responding to them immediately instead of the next morning. Unrealistic targets to be achieved and pages and pages of extra tasks lists daily. This resulted in her launching a witch hunt against me to get me fired, where they tried everything to terminate me from the company, from claiming nepotism to sexual harassment, 
victimizing staff members to stealing from the business, all to no avail and no proof. Everything they tried to use against me, I had proof it was not me. Witnesses who would back me up and a re reputation that was unfaltering. However, this constant stress, harassment and bullying combined with mum guilt for not seeing my baby, I was working all the time, triggered me to have a mental breakdown and telling them to go stick it and leaving. If only I knew at the time that no job is worth that. This is another moment that looking back on now showed me that I was worth more. During the next two years, I drifted and dabbled in different industries, trying to find my place. Where did I fit? I graduated with a master's in business administration, an MBN, and after the birth of my second baby, I woke up and realized that I now had two beautiful girls in this world that needed a kick-ass mom to guide them, to inspire, motivate, and empower them, and not have them make the same mistakes I did. I started working on my personal development. It wasn't up to me to find my place in the world. It was up to me to create it. At the end of 2018, I stumbled across the Mums in Business Association on Facebook and became the event coordinator for Mums in Business Association, Blue Mountains, Penrith. And in just under a year, I took a fledgling group of 90 ladies into a thriving, supporting community, encouraging community of almost a 1,000 female entrepreneurs. That's a 1,110% increase. At the end of August 2019, I became the head coordinator for MIBA, Mums in Business Association, Australia and New Zealand. And in just a few short months, we have doubled our presence in Australia and I'm excited to see the growth in 2020. In 2019, I launched my confidence and business coaching business, The Phoenix Within. The decision came after a hectic year of rediscovery and learning about myself again, a year of addressing my truths, opening the closets and releasing the skeletons that were lurking in there and rediscovering the person I was that I had lost. She was easily found but it took time to identify that woman and renew her confidence, optimism, courage, and resilience to build her back up, but finding the right tools and techniques so she could access everything that she had inside her. I was not broken and I did not require fixing. I just needed the direction to find my purpose, my calling, and my passion. The Phoenix Within was created to share my story and to provide women with the same direction, guidance, and encouragement to embark on this journey themselves. I work with women who are lost and unfulfilled, who have woken up, whether it's from childhood trauma, the drunken stupor of their 20s, being blessed to have become a mum, or leaving long-term employment and are ready to reclaim their power. This is only a glimpse of my story, but I hope in sharing my journey that inspires, motivates, and empowers others to find their passion live their purpose, and follow their dreams. I believe we are all born for greatness, no matter what our stories have entailed. I strongly believe that building confidence and embracing our authentic selves is the key to creating that change. There you go. So that was my 3,000 words that I put in this book. And it, as I said, it became a number one Amazon bestseller. So this is why I use the title because I'm an Amazon number one bestseller. So this story, as I said, it was written at the end of 2019. So before all of the COVID stuff happened. So things have changed for me in regards. I have a beautiful new little baby. So we've got three little girls. The Mums in Business Association, unfortunately, um, as I said before, it closed down. So I was their Australian and New Zealand coordinator and it closed down and we had about 75 communities around Australia. It was absolutely amazing. But this is the change that I made and this is why I went on to become and I founded Alibi, so the Australian and Ladies Business Initiative, to give the ladies that left MIBA and other businesswomen a space to go to and still have that community feel and still do everything that they needed to do. So that was just a bit of a glimpse of my story. I shared 3,000 words. If you've ever thought about doing a collaborative book, please go ahead and do it. I will be doing a podcast episode later on that just to look out for some, some positives and some pitfalls because I do feel like there's a lot of people out there that charge a lot to be a part of a collaborative book. 
um, that isn't that necessary. And if you want to write your own story, get it out there. It's a good way to introduce and share your bits. So whether you choose to post that on your social media platforms, create your own blog, or even put it out in your own book, you can absolutely do it. People want to hear your story. And let me know if anything resonated or you have any questions about anything that I've discussed today or the story that I shared, please ask them below. And other than that, I hope you have an amazing day. And if you haven't already, make sure that you're following me on my socials. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please click the subscribe button and I will see you next time.